how did you approach the like separating yourself from the business's failure so you can find the solution and iterate and go towards the success because your first company is basically like it's, it's just you right it's just like a replica of you you feel Absolutely. it like inside it's it's very tough to separate yourself so how how would you approach like what the advice would be to separate yourself from that failure so to be clear i still don't like per se failure but i've redefined what failure means to me and anyone could do it we could do this um, with anything in our lives and we could interpret it differently or, or have a different point of view on it. So my advice would be that failure is not an end. Failure does not have to be an end. Failure might be that insight that allows you to pivot whatever it is that you're attempting to do a little bit or a lot to get closer to wherever it is that you want to go. I could tell you this. Welcome to Execute and Outlast podcast, where we discuss strategies and tools you can use to scale your business to nine figures and beyond. I'm your host, Van Chantimur. This is Execute and Outlast podcast. Enjoy the episode. So Chris, I want to start with a, with a quote that I've heard from you. Entrepreneurship is one of the greatest callings in life, up there with military service, clergy, and religion. Why do you feel this way? First, uh, thanks for the opportunity to chat with you. Um, you know, prior to going live here, we were just kind of just chatting about, you know, what is what does success look like as you're achieving it? And, you know, for a lot of entrepreneurs that are out there, you know, it's scary, right? You know, people spend a lot of time around ideation. So idea generation and, you know, never take the first step, you know, never get the the confidence to do that. So my whole life, 25 years as an entrepreneur has been defined by, by being the, the person that's willing to take the first step, regardless of what comes after it, just building up that own, my own personal confidence, personal power to do that. So the quote you mentioned was something that I learned um, after having sold my first company to a publicly traded company. And when I looked back and said, how could I kind of take the best of what I experienced? Because there were failures and trials and tribulations, but obviously I was successful. I had a story. I was one of the few that was able to exit you know, a business that I gave all of my uh, self to for about a decade. So it occurred to me that entrepreneurship is one of the most powerful and empowering ways to serve your community, to serve um, people that benefit from whatever it is that you sell. So in my case, you know, I come from a small rural town in Pennsylvania here in the United States. Uh, most people have heard of Scranton, Pennsylvania because of the success of the office, uh, among other things. Um, and the show that was on NBC here in the States, but so that's where I'm from. And, um, I just, I embraced my community embraced me. I stood up in 2003 and said that I want to build a company that leverages all of the, the untapped resources of the 13 colleges and universities within a 45 mile radius of where I lived. So my business model was to tap into what they called brain drain, which was young people graduating and then moving to densely populated cities right. to build their careers. And I wanted to build a company here in Northeastern Pennsylvania um, that was sort of an antidote to that. I wanted to give people a different story. I wanted to give them an opportunity to stay home. So without knowing the impact that I would have on my community and um, the impact still to this day, and this is you know a couple decades later from when I first stood up and said that, and I called the company Pepper Jam, but the impact that I had on my community is pretty amazing. So that's why I mentioned and I compare it confidently with other service professions um, with no, you know, I'm not trying to say that, that entrepreneurship is somehow equal to being a military service member or being a member of the clergy. All I'm saying is that it should be considered a form of service, social impact, et cetera. And if you build your business uh, around and look at how you can make a difference in the lives of other people, it absolutely is a service profession. So 
Um, so that's it. And my whole story, Mert, has been around, you know, uh, not only entrepreneurship, but I have been a lifelong learner. So I'm always looking for ways to grow personally and professionally. It's something that I hold myself accountable to. So I'm always looking for ways to um, grow and improve, but also inspire people along the way. And so that's why I said that quote, because I want other entrepreneurs to know that it's worth the fight. It's worth taking that first step. It's worth failing many, many times um, to be able to achieve a level of success where you can make such a incredible impact on other people. So amazing. So uh, the the mindset around entrepreneurship is at the moment is basically uh, people wanting to get rich, right? Like that's the first thing. Do you think that the the purpose comes afterwards? Like when you so as someone who didn't have any money, right? You mm-hmm. you have that goal like in in you to like earn more because it's it's a flywheel. You get the dopamine hit, right? It feels great. Do you think you should after the first success, maybe you become more purpose driven, or is it does it need to start from the beginning to to make an impact? Basically, as an entrepreneur, I think that's an amazing question. I think the reality of of that question, though, is that most of us, when we first start, don't have the maturity to connect all the dots and to really become driven by more than, you know, could I get this idea off the ground? You know, maybe one day I'll be able to, you know, whatever your your financial goal might be. And I, I wasn't sure if you were referencing your own upbringing, but in my case, you're right. You know, uh, for me, you know, I grew up with a single mom, uh, had uh you know, we didn't, money wasn't something that we had. So it wasn't a big part of my life. And certainly when I started my first business, there's absolutely one of the goals was to become independently financially successful. It just quickly became not the most important thing. And I sort of, I've been so fortunate to have many successes, not only Pepper Jam, but a number of other businesses that I invested in, I exited or scaled them. And here's here's my quick take on it. And again, it's almost impossible. If money is your goal out of the gate, money is your goal out of the gate. But when you put things into perspective, I think that wealth and money is relative. Meaning I could say with a lot of confidence that I pretty much have everything that I need, right? So do I need to have goals that include making more money? It's relative. So instead, what I what I did years ago is I replaced that goal of money and I started looking at at other things that would lead to success. You know, because you want to be driven. And for me, um, it was about mastery. And so I've said this many times, but it's it's so true if you look back at my entire story. I've basically studied relentlessly why entrepreneurs fail. And then I'm also obsessed with the ones that leave clues. Those are the those are the ones that have had success. Success leaves clues. So, you know, honestly, I'm obsessed with it. I'm always constantly trying to read and then, you know, or educate myself and then, you know, incorporate some of those ideas or lessons into my own businesses or life to improve them. So yeah, I think I don't being hard on people. I talk to high schoolers and college kids a lot and I tell them, I'm like, you know, society puts so much pressure on you to conform and be something specific. And the truth is, you know, if if you could just build some personal, you know, self-confidence and believe in yourself and be willing to fail miserably uh, or fail happily, um, you know, failure isn't the goal, but a lot, as I said earlier, the number one reason that most people don't swing the bat or they don't swing the bat hard enough is that they're afraid that if they do, they'll fail. So for me, just overcoming that normal way of, of approaching things in life has been one of my biggest purposes, to be honest with you. So my purpose is to defy what I believe through my own education, through my own experience, is why people aren't more successful, why people don't take that first step. So don't be so hard on yourself for anybody that's listening in, um, but make a commitment to what Tony Robbins calls CANI is the acronym, C-A-N-I, constant and never-ending improvement or or continuous and never-ending improvement. And that might sound sappy to people. Oh, I don't want to sign up to that. But you know what? 
type into Google or into ChatGPT, your favorite flavor, you know, uh, what is compounding? What is compound interest? And understand what happens when you make little iterations in anything it is that you're focused on to try to improve it. I mean, at the end of the day, that is the Silicon Valley lean startup model is this idea of iteration over time just results in profound, you know, profound results. What you're saying perfectly makes sense. So, but for a, for a first time entrepreneur, like uh, if someone is just starting, it's, it's very hard to separate yourself, yeah. like um, separate yourself from business's failure. So how, how do you approach, like, how did you approach the, like separating yourself from the business's failure so you can find the like solution and iterate and go towards the success? Because it's very hard for first time entrepreneurs to, because it's it's your as as like your first company is basically just it's, it's just you right it's just like a replica of you you feel Absolutely. it like inside it's it's very tough to separate yourself so how how would you approach like what the advice would be to separate yourself from that failure so to be clear i still don't like per se failure but i've redefined what failure means to me and so and anyone could do it uh we we could do this um, with anything in our lives. We could just take a different, and we could interpret it differently or, or have a different point of view on it. So my advice would be that failure is not an end. Failure does not have to be an end. Failure might be that insight that allows you to pivot whatever it is that you're attempting to do a little bit or a lot to get closer to wherever it is that you want to go. I could tell you this, uh, and I've never met anyone that would disagree with this. Both success and failure is a series of unexpected events, uh, ups and downs. Uh, with my first company, Pepper Jam, we sold it in 2009. But in truth, 2007, we were growing so fast. You know, there was... I was learning the difference between um, looking back in terms of your success and being able to project your cash flow moving forward. I thought we were going to die. You know, I I didn't. I wasn't a hundred percent sure we were going to make it through. And not only did we make it through, we disrupted the industry. We, um, you know, until this day, you know, some almost fifteen years later, I'm in you know, conversations around the world and the name Pepper Jam comes up and, and inevitably someone will be like, oh my God, you're that guy. Like you were part of that and all. And so, and there were many times that we, you know, we, we didn't make the right decision or we made a decision and we thought we were right only to be wrong. It, it's not an end point. It's, I would really encourage folks to, to keep an open mind about that, that, that life in and of itself is a series of um, unexpected events. But if you work on yourself, you know, you work on your, your, your personal uh, perspective on the world, you know, you develop optimism, you develop resilience, you know, you develop the ability to think through things, you know, and that, that improves with age and experience. But I, honestly, I was a, you know, a, a poor kid you know, single mom. And, you know, by the time I was in my twenties, I had sold a business for millions and millions of dollars. And I was like, whoa, okay. I think life's going to be a little bit different for me moving forward. You know? Um, and honestly, like I said, it's all relative at the moment when I sold the business, you know, my first business, it was like, I did feel like I achieved something that I was grateful for that very few people get to, to achieve. But then I felt like this huge responsibility because I was so young when that happened, you know, now what do I do? How do I, what's my second, what's my third, you know, success going to look like? Um, but I would just encourage people that entrepreneurship, and this is another opinion of mine, it's pretty strong. Entrepreneurship is about building some of those personal qualities, resilience, you know, ability to sort of be okay with not getting exactly what it is that you're working towards. So Hundred um, percent. I gave this example before as well in the podcast. The um, so, for example, if you are trying to learn an instrument and you are trying to play the guitar, you, nobody would expect you to play a song perfectly in your first go. And if you if you place a wrong note in a wrong like place, you wouldn't call that failure. You would say like, "I'm practicing this." Right? It's it's just basically the same thing. You are trying to 
master the like game of business and you are trying like you're practicing like these are fail these are not failures because um i heard this from uh, i guess alex hormozy at last um he says like you cannot lose like if you can like if you don't quit like you can't lose if you don't quit which is 100% you're a million percent double click on that it's totally true and it, that's why it's so important just to believe in yourself you know if I, I'm a big believer in um, things like the law of attraction. So I, I do believe that we have the ability to visualize things that haven't happened yet. And by virtue of doing so, so even if you just failed, I mean, if all you focus on is the failure, it's going to be very difficult to take the next step. But if you see that as nothing more than an obstacle in your journey to become a virtuoso guitar player or a master. I've met, I am very fortunate because five or six years ago, um, I ended up in the entertainment industry as an investor and as an entrepreneur. And I've met so many people that if I were to name drop, you know, you'd be like, whoa, that's a master. The truth is many of these people have become my friends and they're still working towards mastery. Just to your point, you know, yeah, maybe they started AKA playing the guitar years ago, or, you know, maybe they're, if they're a comedian or something like that, you know, I know stories of my one business partner who, when he first went out, man, he bombed every single time. And now he sells out comedy shows left and right, but he's been doing it for 20 some years, you know, and, and he also embraced how difficult success is, you know, um, Sometimes you get up in front of an audience, just call it three, four, 500 people in a comedy club. And, you know, you need to be able to adapt to that audience, you know, and, and, you know, you, you need to be able to throw out a couple of jokes and, and if, and if they're not hitting, you know, be able to move quickly. It's not unlike that with anything. So, so yeah, no. And I think, you know, the questions that you've asked so far are super, super critical to, um, someone who might be thinking about entrepreneurship or someone who's been doing it and they just feel like they haven't, they haven't had a break yet. Um, one of the things I learned fairly early in my career is that the difference between failure and like outsized success is so close. It is so close. And to your point, which I think is the smartest thing that's been said on this, uh, podcast so far, it's that you're going to get back at it and improve it, improve yourself to, to pick up the additional skills and, and make it through. That's why if you are willing to swing the bat and you don't get what you want and it doesn't work out, that's okay. You just keep iterating. So yeah, the, the, the point of the business itself is just to like, keep, keep going. Right. It's, and it's, it's the same with the, the like infinite games. Like it's as like Simon Sinek says, like the goal of like health is not to win at health is just like stay healthy or uh, the goal of the business is just stay in the business. Like a uh, infinite game is like the, the perspective has to be different when you're trying to like basically improve yourself. As you said, compounding is, is a like critical thing to understand here. It's just like 1% improvement uh, every day. It's just 37%, 37 times better. You're 37 times better if you improve 1% every day, which is which is crazy. The um, I want to um, hear about the the Pepper Jam origin story. Uh, if you yeah. if you um, share that story, it's 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 an epic story. I want to hear it. <laughs> yeah. So, all and, and the interesting thing is, I I used to be incapable of telling the story in like three or four minutes, just because it is so. It was the defining you know, part of my life. But, but I'll tell you this, when I was a, an, um, a teenager, I remember my mom saying to me, you know, get your ass out of bed and make your mom proud. And there was just something about the combination of that and some of the health struggles my mom went through that I was like, I am not going to fuck this up. So I became a high achiever and I would basically approach everything that I wanted or that I wanted to achieve with this attitude of, I have everything that I need within me to be as successful as anyone else, really, as long as I was willing to work hard, as long as I was willing to do the right things. So I was like a professional student after high school. I went for nine years. I got an undergraduate degree from Penn State. 
I went for graduate school. I got a master's degree from Villanova University in experimental psychology. And then I went to law school and um, graduated from law school. But it was that high achiever gene, that mindset that I applied to an idea. My brother called me. He said, what do you think about marketing our grandmother's gourmet food? She called it Mississippi Mud. Through a couple of different, for a couple of different reasons, we decided to rename it Pepper Jam. And um, I, at that time, was talking about this is the late 90s. I was talking about how the internet was really like, I was like, Rick, my brother's name is Rick. I was like, dude, this is going to change stuff, man. This is big, big, big. So he called me out. He said, let's, let's create a business around grandma's gourmet food product, but can you build us a website? And all this. So I basically self educated. He basically called my bluff. I self educated, worked my ass to just try to understand the internet. First, it was building websites, HTML, that kind of thing. Then I kind of started to like have some success. And I was like, okay, what's this search engine optimization? Okay. Um, I, I get this. And, you know, as I was self educating. And then I stumbled upon another industry called affiliate marketing. And so we went from a gourmet food website in 1998-99 to me getting pretty good at SEO and affiliate um, such that by like 2000, the year 2000, 2001, you know, our first, my first check was nothing. It was like 30 some dollars for, like, for a month. Um, and then by the time I was in law school, you know, it was, uh, you know, we were about a $3 million company you know, generating any given month, you know, 150 to $300,000, um, a good portion of it was profit. So I went from, from literally being in law school with some, uh, scholarship money that was partly need-based to losing that because I had means at that point. Um, and then when I graduated from law school, um, I decided that I was going to be a full-time entrepreneur and I already told you the story about what I did is I, I came home, I came home cause I went to law school in New York, came home and I, and I knew that at the time they were talking about how young people were leaving. They called it brain drain. I said, well, what if we, what if I build a sort of an innovative company and instead of letting them leave, like I harness that untapped resource. And so within call it a year, year and a half, we were up to about 130 employees um, and the cool thing was at that time, it was early in the internet and, and, and tech for that, mo for at least internet tech, um, we were getting the best people. So some of the most amazing people I've ever worked with in my career. And so I built this digital marketing and technology company and we pivoted around 2000, we pivoted the gourmet food company into something called Grandma Jones's Originals, which my brother oversaw. And then I went off and I built this this digital marketing and eventually an affiliate network, um, which again, I sold in 2009 to eBay. From there in 2010, I started an investment fund uh, called KBJ Capital. And um, the goal there was, you know, can I, can I invest some of the proceeds from the exit in a way that could help other entrepreneurs, you know, along their journey? That's what I've been doing for the last 13 years. But one of the things I'll say is that that journey had many moments where I became a founder or co-founder of one of the companies I invested in. And I either would put, I'd find someone and put them in charge of the business, pretty much like I've done with my digital marketing company, lseo.com. Um, or I just flip the hat and I take an active role as the, as the founder and CEO. And so there've been, um, I believe it's seven companies total that I have founded or co-founded, um, over those 15 years post the exit of pepper jam. Um, my portfolio companies have raised some 40 million plus dollars. Um, we have been fortunate, um, to have several exits. Um, and some of them completely just didn't work out, you know, and we, I spent a ton of money and time. And in a weird way, I, I kind of expected it not to go perfectly, you know, but I, the same attitude that I talked about earlier, which is like, it's not necessarily what happens to you, but how you interpret it and how you go on with your life after you have 
you know, something occurs that is less than ideal. But so yeah, Pepper Jam in, in its day in that, in the two thousands, you know, became somewhat, um, you know, uh, you know, it was, it was sort of a pioneer and also, you know, found itself in the conversation of the early internets from say 2000 through 2010, the company still exists. When eBay, uh, broke away from PayPal, they went into three separate businesses, the eBay auction business, PayPal, and what was called eBay enterprise, which was, which was my company. Um, that company now is called, went back to pepper jam and is owned by a company out of the UK actually. It was so fast, like the, the growth was so fast. I'm I'm sure everybody, like everything was breaking. Like how did you handle that process? It was weird. It was like, here's another thing about entrepreneurship. And I've, and I am definitely a testament to this is, you know, I've never wanted to be, I had never, I, like, I'm not an actor. I'm not an actress. I'm not a musician, professional musician. I'm not, I'm not a celebrity. However, in the entrepreneurial world, you know, when you build a company that got as much press and as much attention as Pepper Jam did, you know, I've been fortunate enough to be able to write best-selling books. You know, I've been able to um, speak all around the world. Um, and you feel it's not, doesn't make, trust me, I'm not saying I'm a celebrity, but in that world, when you're the keynote and there's 10,000 people in front of you, in that moment, it's your stage. You are, the, you are the rock star. Yep. Yeah. And, and you and I never <laughs> expected that, but that's one of the byproducts of, of Pepper Jam was just that it it happened at a certain time in the development of affiliate marketing and SEO and all this stuff, such that it it made me one of the early people. And now, you know, when you, if you, if you look at like the the early uh, history of SEO and affiliate, you know, some of those people. Um, that really were first are, are some of my closest friends because they respected me. You know, I wasn't first. I wasn't, you know, I didn't invent affiliate marketing or I didn't invent SEO. I was just one of the first ones to- um, Syst Systematize it, it basically. Yeah, yeah, systematize it, move it along, evolve it. Uh, on so uh, Certainly, I, I'll take some credit for helping evolve uh, affiliate marketing with Pepper Jam. I thought that what we did with our affiliate network um, while it wasn't per se original, it was innovative. Like we made progress based on what the other affiliate networks were doing at that, at that time. So, um, yeah, it's changed, it's changed my entire life. Everything else has been, um, you know, listen, it's entrepreneurship still tough, but you know, it opened a lot of doors. Like right this second, I'm sitting on the fifth floor of a five-story building with that I own with LSEO up at the top of it. And uh, my root beer company's down on the fourth floor. My merch company's down on the first floor. It's, you know, I'm very so fortunate amazing. to have, have, have not only achieved the dream, which is, man, maybe I could, you know, build something that people like, and then maybe I could sell it one day. Um, but I did that fairly early in my career. And now I have experience as, as an investor, public speaker, writer, commercial real estate owner, it's interesting. You could do a lot with um, entrepreneurship to live a very, very f fulfilling and just ridiculous life. Um, in yeah, terms it, of it just, just, it just again, opens up a lot of like doors. Yeah, you're not necessarily a celebrity, but you know, if you're a successful entrepreneur, I will tell you this from my experience that influencers, you know. It's a different, you know, influencer means a lot of things, but actors, actresses, musicians, um, you know, I've had some really interesting experiences where they have a tremendous amount of respect and they want to be friends with successful entrepreneurs that could help them, you know, whatever it is, get into business or whatever. So that's been one of the most interesting parts of my career is that I live in rural Pennsylvania and somehow, you know, over the last, you know, 10 plus years, I've been able to work with a ton of influencers. I remember when I, uh, this goes back to like 2016 or something, 2017, I was on the Apple TV's first reality TV show. It was called Planet of the Apps. Wow. I was on, I was on that and I was cast 
alongside my my business partner, who is an actor and a comedian by the name of Damon Wayans Jr. But when we were just the, the quick thirty seconds, is that that was a show that had um, Will I Am from the Black Eyed Peas, Jennifer Alba, who's an actress, Gwyneth Paltrow, who's an actress, and Gary Vaynerchuk, who's an entrepreneur. Wow! And um, so we, I fly out. My partner lives in LA, but I fly out to, to West Hollywood and, and get cast on this TV show. And my partner, Damon and I, and again, he's the celebrity I'm coming down the, the escalator. Cause that's what they had. And I was friends with Gary B and Gary's like, Chris, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> you know, like, so the, I've had these that, experiences. That's, that's such a good impression, by the way. That's such a good impression. There is, he said it too. Cause we, Damon and I did his, um, ask Gary V. A show like you can yeah. google it if you if anybody is interested in watching it damon's always funny so forget about me he's hilarious but gary gary said that he was like dude he's like i couldn't believe he's like you got cast on a tv show oh. here i am blah 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 but we ended up working with will i am ironically uh gary did vote for us but then like it's a little like made for tv drama um but but anyway, man, yeah. So so the Pepper Jam story opened up a ton of doors. Um, it's 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 really given me a lot of opportunities that I I I, I could only hope that you uh, and you know others that are listening could have similar experiences because it's been pretty kick-ass. so amazing. I want to ask this: Do you think the because you tasted success like really early within your business? Do you think it would be the same if you? didn't like feel the success as quickly as you did. I guess like what I'm trying to ask is how important is the momentum like when you're starting out as an entrepreneur? Oh man, that is such a good question. Um, you know, again, I think life is not about, you know, everything that happens to you, but how you deal with what happens to you. And again, my, my story is pretty crazy, you know, in that, you know, I, I was able to achieve success by almost anybody's definition early in my career, but I, I think it's nice. I guess what I'll say is this, I have an opinion on it, but I, I, I've never really spoken much on it publicly. And that's that, um, I actually believe that timing and luck play a much larger role in success and failure than, um, a lot of the other things that we attribute to success and failure. And I believe with Pepper Jam, legit, right time, right place, uh, almost accidental that it happened and became as big as it did. But what I'll say is that, you know, as long as you believe that anything's possible, as long as you have the capacity, well, everybody has the capacity and the ability to dream and to visualize and and really juice yourself up and get yourself excited about the, your potential, your personal potential. Um, if, as long as you're willing to do that and try to keep that, that state, that energy high as frequently as possible, you're going to have so many successes. You're going to have so many um, stories. It's just about your attitude. It really, it really sincerely is. And again, it's all relative. You know, I have, Friends that, that, I mean, Jesus, I've been so fortunate, you know, I have friends that have companies that are, have a billion dollar valuation and, you know, some of them are, are really struggling with happiness. There's this, um, I'm doing it again this year, every year in, um, in Germany, it's actually held in Austria. Now there's this invitation only gathering of some of the top growth marketers in the world. And if there's a limited number, I'm, I go as one of the experts, um, you know, it'll be this year, it'll be the CMO from Facebook, you know, it'll be, um, you know, the head of marketing at um, Disney, those types of people. And to go there as a spectator, it costs 5,000 euros and you have to like apply and all this stuff. But the reason I'm bringing that up is that every time I go to this event, Inevitably, I spend time with people much more successful than I've ever been in different ways. And I spend time with people that are earlier in their career. 
I'll share one quick story. And uh, I don't think I'm going to get in trouble for, for sharing this because whatever we talk about, whatever we talk about there is, is, is confidential. However, one of my good friends in the SEO industry uh, is a guy by the name of Joost Volk. Uh, Joost uh, founded the epically popular plugin, the Yoast plugin. Um, when early in that group, so it was, you know, maybe it was like his third year being there, he got up in front of us and basically just self deprecated. He said, you know, it feels like everybody out in the audience are millionaires. And he's like, I'm not. Go ahead and, and, uh, uh, Google what happened to Yoast and his, his beautiful wife, uh, about a year ago when he sold Yoast for an undisclosed sum that I know that uh, will ever change his life. He just started his own investment fund. Um, he sold it to the parent of web.com. Um, can't think of their name right now. But my point though is like, it doesn't matter where you're sitting right now. If you believe in the potential, you're willing to stick it out. And as you said, you know, continue to train, you know, continue to iterate, um, you know, success is imminent. It, it just, it just is. And it, you know, it, it's not isolated, you know, it's success comes and then you have a, a challenge in your life and then you overcome the challenge and you keep going. But, um, I do believe that it's, you know, important that people focus on self-improvement. Like, you know, maybe there are shortcuts, but, but don't be someone who tries to become successful just through shortcuts, you know, be willing to put the time in, you know, be willing to get more cerebral, intellectual about what's working and what's not. Like, hold yourself accountable. You know, I always say, think things through. You know, um, don't look for outside reasons why something isn't working well. Own it. You know, I think that's again one of the clear differentiators of me as a person and other entrepreneurs is that if something goes wrong, I'm the first one to say, you know, I need to fix something. You know, I, I don't blame someone, that kind of thing. So, yeah. A lot of wisdom in this, uh, you know, in this in this podcast today. <laughs> I want to I want to get your opinion on one more thing because you started a lot of businesses, you ventured in a lot of areas. How do you evaluate risk in a like if you are trying to start a new business? Do you see it as maybe like risky or like how do you define risk in your mind? As an entrepreneur, there's two answers, and I'm going to be brief. Number one, you've got to decide if what you're trying to build is a lifestyle business or if it's something that you want to build and sell one day. Because the approach that you take to both of them around risk is completely different. You calculate it differently. If you're if you're trying to build a business that you could raise capital and eventually sell, you know you're going to take on a lot more risk. Cause you, cause you have to, that that's how you get your outsized gain. Whereas right. if it's a, a lifestyle business and sometimes people don't even, they don't even think about this. A lifestyle business would be, I want to own my own business so that I can make enough income to do A, B, and C, you know, travel to Costa Rica three times a year, buy a plate, whatever it is, but it's lifestyle based. It's not your, your outcome for it is really just to make money. So you don't have to per se take as much risk around it. Whereas if you're doing the, um, if you're building it to sell, which I did to Pepper Jam, um, right. a lot of people don't know that, but at that time I was like, I wanted to build a business that I could sell. I'm, I mean, and, and so a lot of the decisions that I made over the years reflected that I've given, um, presentations on some of my thinking regarding that, you know, when you, when you're building a business that you want to sell, you have to you know, think through, visualize and write down who are some of the prospective buyers. And you want to think, think about ways for you to be able to kind of crawl, walk, run with them in terms of what, what's called a partnership. But if right. they see the value, basically you see your company as a product, right? And them, them as a, as the buyer, like right away. Yeah. I mean, I see them as a partner. I think, you know, partners like to okay. dance first and then get married later. And so, um, but, but again, lifestyle business versus something that you build and sell. The second is, um, cause you asked about risk is I think risk is related to the size of your market. 
if the market, which they call like when you're raising capital, it's called total addressable market and all investors kind of use it to determine risk profile. If the market's really, really big, the risk of failing is lower. And the, 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 okay. the likelihood of an outsized gain, while it might be more remote, is worth the investment, is worth the effort. So pretty much every you know, Series A and beyond Holy. investor in the Silicon Valley, you know, their, their golden rule is, you know, can, is the market, is the total addressable market that, that this entrepreneur has a business that he's trying to solve a problem, is it, you know, is it, does it start with a B, you know, is it at least a billion dollars such that even right. if they don't become the market leader, they could still become a really big company. So I think when I think about risk, I think about it that way. Like for instance, I mean, I have 25 years of entrepreneurial experience. Chances are I could probably, and I'm not saying this is an absolute, but I could probably start, you know, a pizza restaurant anywhere and and have a pretty good because I would look yeah. for location. I would look for these kind of things. And I would probably have a pretty high likelihood of success. However, the size of that opportunity is pretty, pretty limited. You know, it's, it's limited to that, to that one restaurant. Now, if my business model was different, that I wanted to create one restaurant every, or I wanted to open one restaurant every three months for the first three years. And then I wanted to do 10 per month. Then you're like, Starbucks coffee or something like that. So it really does come down to your, your idea and, and what the plan is. So I don't, risk is, risk is real, uh, but it, it's, it's honestly, you could, you could mitigate it by taking big swings such that every swing you make doesn't have to connect. Even if you connect on one or two out of your 10, your, the, your outcome is so huge. Whereas a lot of people take small little swings and they, they don't really, care much, maybe because they just want to build the lifestyle business or whatever, but they don't care as much about really analyzing like what is the what's the what's the most likely outcome for this particular idea, this particular business idea. At at first when you're starting out, uh, when you have nothing, it's easy to bet everything, right? The what I realize now, when you have something, it's very hard to bet everything on a on a big idea. So which which comes down to how you keep innovating and like making big bets when you have something to lose? Man, it's individual. I think the best advice isn't necessarily the way that I've lived my life. I had very, very high tolerance for not having money because I didn't have any money before I had money. And it wasn't like my first job legitimately was my own business. So it, it wasn't, uh, I didn't have much to compare it to. However, my answer to that is probably the smartest thing that I did was that when I, it kind of started before I sold Pepper Jam, but when I sold Pepper Jam, I really, I really did diversify. Um, you know, I didn't want to just take all of that and put it into my investment fund. And so I ended up, you know, buying, you know, a decent amount of real estate. Um, I invested in a franchise business. I uh, loan started loaning money. There was a lot of different things. So now, so even when certain things didn't work out, you know, I still had diversification. So once you have money, you know, it's probably best to take a decent portion of that and and diversify it. It, it just just don't make it only about your next big idea because just like when you go to a casino. Um, and you feel lucky. It's just a matter of time where luck turns and you could lose it all. So yeah, I look back and I'm like, oh man, that was so smart that I did this or did that or whatever. Um, and there are no, listen, I know we all look for right answers. Um, I'm not sure I gave any, all I, you know, life is a series of, of, of opportunities and obstacles. And it's, I swear to God, I really, from the bottom of my heart, um, one of the, I like when we were chatting before we started the podcast, like I, I don't like coming into interviews, even if I'm like on TV or up on stage in front of thousands of people wanting to be overprepared. I'd, I'd rather, I believe that authenticity 
and just trying to become closer to, to, to who you truly are versus something calculated, it's always served me well. When people will see me speak or whatever, they'll be like, whoa, man, that guy, how did he just pull that off? Part of it is, is that I'm just super authentic. Like, I'm not kidding. Like, I'm just, I, I'll tell you, like, if you didn't ask me, like, what my biggest failure was or any of those things, but I don't like, I don't need to sugarcoat things. Um, <laughs> and so the truth of success is that it's possible and it's elusive and it's relative. Yep. I do think that it's worth setting goals that reflect success in whatever way that means for you. And just like we were chatting earlier, your purpose initially for why you want to be successful might be as simple as, hey, man, I just want to be able to, you know, uh, have enough money in the bank to buy a home or to do whatever. Um, but once you achieve that, you know, what's next? And I think, I think that the answer is, is that just like Tony Robbins said, you know, life is about c- continuous and never ending improvement. And I don't mean that in a sappy way. And I'm not telling you how to be or how to think, but find out for you, anybody that's listening, what that means for you, how you could make a decision that each day, you know, uh, or every two days, you know, don't put too much pressure on yourself. You could take action that could improve the way you think about things, the way that you treat people, the way that you communicate with people, the, the, the types of things that could, could help you build confidence to feel more comfortable taking action. In my opinion, these are the things that lead to success. Not having a lot of money. It's the willingness to have, um, you know, willingness to continually learn, you know, until the, your last breath. So so true. I want to um, get your perspective on this as well, um, if I may. <laughs> um, so what I'm trying to understand is, like most of the people says, like passion is very important. You have to be passionate about the thing that you're doing. I understand that. But what I've seen from my life is it's not the passion. It's basically just the discipline. You just have to be consistent enough to show up every day, regardless of your feelings, emotions, doesn't matter. Just show up, do the work necessary and get it done and you will be successful. So because I don't have like, I don't think about the happiness that way, if it makes sense. So like in your life or in your experience, because you have met a lot of successful entrepreneurs as well, how much of the success comes from the discipline and how much comes from the actual passion side? So like, is it really important to to do something that you are passionate about at the core? Or do you think the, the discipline is is the more important thing? It's really a great question. And, and there is no right answer. I mean, I think it's it's different for certain people. The discipline part is something that you could control. You know, right. um, you know, just like we've been chatting, you know, as long as you're willing to put in the work and, you know, be open to iterating as you go along, um, you know, you're, you will, you will eventually have success. The passion side, what's interesting is that I think that life should be lived with a sense of um, belief in yourself and that anything is possible and, um, and that you're willing to work hard in pursuit of that. So I don't think it's, it's, it's one or the other. Um, a lot of the stuff that I enjoy, it's in a weird way because I feel like I could control it in a positive way is very mundane. You know, I, I don't, I'll often do it myself. This is one of the things that I take pride in and I embraced it early in my career is that, you know, a lot of people like to tell, I prefer to show. In other words, you know, I don't think I'm a know-it-all. Um, but I could give you some websites that I've personally SEO'd that completely crush, you know what I mean? So I could say, go buy my book, or I could say, check out some of my work. And so that's why I've, I've almost, I enjoy some of the mundane, you know, intricate, you know, kind of things that I don't feel like I'm too good to, to do. 
but I am a passionate dude. And I think particularly when I'm around people that are really successful, they, they often will feel that and sense that about me. They'll say, you know, this is someone that is confident. This is someone who believes in himself, you know, uh, and this is someone, you know, if they know my backstory, this is someone who's going to deliver. And so, you know, early on before I had that, it was just the belief, just the passion. And then it was the consistency, you know, of, wow, he's going to do it. Oh, wow. He could do it again. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't spend much time thinking about it, but again, the metaphor, I'm in a five-story building with my company on the top, you know, you come into our downtown and all you could see is my building, you know, it's on the local news because it's the backdrop, you know, it's like, so I don't really think much about those things, but it is pretty overt and pretty clear that, you know, I'm on a mission that I'm very passionate and that I'm going to put the work in. And I'm also going to swing the bat and do things that other people might feel uncomfortable doing. And I'm willing to lose. I'm willing to fail. I don't expect to lose, just to be clear. I don't expect to fail. Those are two things that I'm not, I don't look, you know, I don't focus on. But if they happen, it's a, it's a signal to that, that something I did needs, you know, I need to iterate it. I need to change it a bit. And so, so that's it. It's not one or the other working hard and learning how to work are equally important. You know, not just, I've I've said that many times, you know, in my life, I've seen people who work really, really hard and they, um, they start to expect things as a result. No, that's not how it works. Working hard is assumed success is not. So you have to be able to to iterate, and you have to be able to say this isn't oh, this isn't working. And you and you're you know you're your own judge of you know how much time you give yourself. And I would say err on the side of giving yourself a little bit more time than you think you need to conclude that this ain't working. Um, and again, success leaves clues. So look to other people. Some of the best podcasts I've ever done are people just like yourself who are who are independently successful. And are just curious. A lot of them. I mean, look at some of the best podcasts. Do you think Joe Rogan really needs a podcast? Do you think Jason Calcanis really needs a podcast? Do you think Gary Vee at this point really needs to be podcasting? You know, it's um, this is this is success. This is this is life. That's why I think podcasting and journalism still is so, particularly videography and stuff, is just so profoundly impactful because we get to do this. What is it? Cost each of us about an hour of our day. I see this as you know one of the more valuable parts of my day because I get to talk to you and give back. I mean, I wouldn't have done it. I'm not doing it for personal reasons. So anyway, I, I've enjoyed it. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I will tell you this for anybody that's listening: is that no matter what your backstory is, you sincerely do have everything you need within you right now to take the first step towards whatever it is that you want, whoever you want to be or whatever. But understand that process is going to have a lot of ups and downs and will require you to stay focused, work hard and be optimistic, you know? And if you do that, maybe, you know, and I hope, you know, uh, depending on how old somebody is, you know, 20 years into someone's career, like I am 20 plus, um, I've had a lot of, a lot of different successes. And honestly, I swear to God on my life, I will leave you with this. It's not actually a quote. It's just a, a fact. Warren Buffett, who is one of the richest people in the world. Uh, at one point he was the richest person, but he's very philanthropic, made a disproportionate amount of his wealth something like 70 to 85% of his wealth. I believe, I know it's after the age of 50, but it, it might even be after the age of 60 or 70. And so, you know, depending on how old you are, don't give up. And, and number two, it's just like anything, you know, it's life is, you know, it, it becomes a little bit easier, even though it's still hard. So believe yeah. in yourself. Don't ever think that you're out of the game. Um, it is a game. It is a game. And I mean that in a positive way. It's fun. You can make a difference in the world and, um, and you could have some experiences, you know, like I have, um, that I still like, you know, I still, to this moment, I'm like, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy and I'm still living the story 
and I'm just getting started. So. So amazing. Chris, yeah. um, you're an amazing person. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I, I wanted to ask you more questions, but we are short on time. That's okay. Uh, maybe next time. Um, where can our audience find your work? Maybe they can reach out to you and ask for some wisdom. Yeah, I've always been fairly transparent and um, accessible. Um, any of the social networks, um, my handle is usually either my name with the K, K R I S J O N E S, um, or um, my investment fund, KBJ Capital. Um, you know, connect with me, send me a LinkedIn, make a little note saying that, you know, you, you listen to this podcast. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and that's it. And there's a lot of different portfolio companies and stuff. People could go to kbjcapital.com or my personal website, chrisjones.com and check it out. All right. Thank you so much, Chris. Awesome. Thank you. All right. We are out. Thank you for listening to this conversation. At Execute and Outlast, we are all about success as a mindset. We understand the hard work, dedication, and determination it takes to build a thriving business. If you're learning or enjoying this podcast, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It is a great zero-cost way to support us. Grab the Execute reading list that is helping me scale my business to eight figures at this moment. You can find that at executeandoutlast.com. That is executeandoutlast.com. If you have any topic or guest suggestions, please leave them on our YouTube comments. I do read all the comments and will answer all of your questions as much as possible. Until next time.